So like I said, this is like a personal interpretation of different theories. And that through the last year, just reflect, you know, I just found things that reflected how I felt. And I just want to present it in a way which I hope is going to be as uh, personal and accessible as my work can be sometime. Or I hope it is. So, <clears throat> it's called Interaction Theories. What I would like to bring about tonight is a discussion over meaning. Meaning in a very broad sense, but mostly in a very practical sense. How we experience it in the run of our day, in our day-to-day -day life, how we use it and how we can get used by it. Meaning, I find, is a very unclear concept. It can point towards definition, such as found in our dictionaries, it can signify knowledge, it can be taken as an expression of oneself, such as, this is what I mean, or, more often, I don't understand what you mean. A meaning can be a perception, an evaluation, a judgment, and so on. The list can be endless. Meaning, in the sense I want to abort it tonight, is twofold, and is based around the concept of perception. The twofold aspect subdivides so. On one side is how I perceive the world out there as a separate thing from myself, and on the other side, how I perceive myself as my own thing inside myself as it is often expressed. In the attitude how I perceive the world out there, sometimes we are quite aware of, as when stopping for a red light at a crossroad, or at being nice to your mother or father-in-law. On other occasions, we are quite unaware of. We will tend to use words then such as fate, destiny, praise God in heaven, or blame Lucifer down below, or put it down to old inescapable human nature. Dems the brakes, as they say. The how I see myself attitude is often ground for much anxiety. Much anxiety. Its primary concern is one of identity, who am I, what am I, along with why was I born, and why am I going to die. Here again, on, on some occasions, we are quite aware of, as an example for myself, my name is Guy, I was born from the union of Norman, Norma Giard and Gertrude Valcourt, place of birth Canada, therefore I am Canadian, and I am an artist since I make art. On the not so easy to answer side of the question, the one we don't put too much awareness in, many institutions are there to show us what to think. Religions gave us a soul, governments gave us countries to die for, and mothers gave us ask your father when he gets home. All in all, they are there to reassure us in our beliefs, and God forbids if you should question what they say, they possess the truth you would have to be out of your right mind not to see their truth. Sadly enough, thousands of institu institutionalized so-called mental patients are the legacy of not seeing the truth. In the same line of thought, what I wish to present to you tonight is not a truth to which I am trying to convert you to. Neither am I here to preach any personal gospel about life. In my view, a truth is only a truth in relation to itself, in the same way that your interpretation of my artwork are as valid as my own interpretation of my artworks. None worse, none better. This I shall develop more in depth next week in the Mythologies of Art lecture. So my aim is not to convince you of anything. That for me is crossing the line between sharing ideas and imposing ideas. I'm sure you wouldn't like if somebody would come and tell you how to live your life. We get enough of that already from the media. I'm sorry, but my soap doesn't wash wider than your soap. To each his own formula. What I see left then is for me to talk about my world and how I see myself in it. To invite you to come here. And hopefully, I shall have learned more about myself and more about you by the time each of us goes home later on. In itself, writing this lecture has already taught me a lot, for which I can only thank you for creating this occasion. 
Awareness and self-reflection would be a cornerstone in what, I guess, I would have to call my personal philosophy. Although I would prefer to call it my way of life. I generally try to avoid using big words and generalization to describe my ideas. But they are about the only tools taught to us in order to communicate. So I do have to use them. If not, we won't be able to understand each other. The same holds for this lecture, where we are both following the rules. You are sitting over there. I am speaking over here. I am speaking, you are listening, which is fine by me. But there are also other underlying implications, such as me presently being in a position of power, and supposedly I'm wiser because I am over here and you are over there. Personally, I don't give a hoot about these things, but they surround and affect us every day. I would prefer listening out of interest than rather out of respect, which for me has to do with rules, values, and conventions. I have no choice and have to use what is available to me. But awareness and reflection on this gives me an opportunity to use these conventions while keeping a distance to the values they vehiculate, such as right and wrong, better or worse, valuable or worthless. Awareness and self-reflection also helps me in bridging the artificial gap between how I perceive the world out there and how I perceive myself. Artificial because I don't believe in a gap between these two. But as I have said, I must first accept what is there before having any ideas of transcending it any further. To go beyond, to go further is my favorite motto. And I am sure it will be engraved on my tombstone when I will finally go beyond what we imagine that to be. But I am in no particular hurry to get there. <laughs> so, how I perceive the world around me and how I perceive myself, I understand as the two sides of the same coin, or better, the two halves of the same apple. If I would try to picture what creation might have been, might have been like, I would imagine this giant holy stainless steel knife coming down and chop, cutting the holy nothingness and bang, there we are, stuck with two halves, which so far man has been repeating and repeating to the point that we are now splitting atoms when we are not splitting hairs. So I believe in this duality in all aspects of life and look for it in everything I come across. In a very poetic way, I would like to picture man and woman as part of this duality, as two halves coming together to reenact the other side of creation, one of reunification as opposed to one of separation. We all know what can happen when these two get together, and I would change the word procreation, or procreation, which makes it sound purposeful and dutiful, to recreation or recreation which is more neutral and sounds more fun anyway. So for my understanding, not only are we stuck with these two halves, we have also no way of putting them back together. Taking the terms I've used so far, I would connect how I perceive the world out there with the attitude of separation, of cutting things apart, and how I perceive myself with the aspect of reunification, of bringing things together. The difficulties I encounter most frequently at this point comes from the cutting apart mentality, which has been predominant in this world since they took over magic and myth. This mentality, which I would describe as the scientific mentality, loves to cut things apart and create structures in which to classify them. Their aim is to define everything by laws, and they hate to share their beds with anybody there must be one and only one law for everything. What I am bringing forward is an attitude of complementary, one of completing the other. But this other side has its own system and its own set of rules, if I can call them so. And one set of rules cannot apply to the other. So I'm not denying or putting down the scientific approach but I am proposing that there exists a 50-50 relationship between the scientific and the non-scientific, the non-quantifiable realm. 
to be even more precise, I perceive it as a 100%, 100% relationship. Not so much complementary, but of interdependence, interexistence, if I can say. Underlying that the existence of one is dependent on the existence of the other. It is difficult to describe what that non-quantifiable realm consists of for two main reasons. One being the focus for so many centuries on the development of the scientific mind, and the other that our present vocabulary being the result of all those centuries of scientific thinking, we are at loss for words to describe it. But I think if we would take out of a dictionary all words referring to measurements along with all comparatives, replacing them with proverbs, old wives' tale, Greek mythology, Nordic tales, Celtic tales, and so forth, <clears throat> we would get a clearer picture of what I am pointing towards. What I am talking about is far from being a new concept. It might be as old as the first thinking man. The yin-yang symbol is the best visual representation of what I have described here. The rational complementing the emotional. So how do I reconcile meaning with this rational emotional duality? Well, the scientific mind has tried for centuries to make sense of life. And aside from some good things, have brought us the tools for assured annihilation. And we also emotionally progressed, as by example with the Charter of Rights, but we are still at war. The rational has tried for centuries to find meaning through matter, and hasn't so far succeeded. And hundreds of philosophers have rubbed their forehead with the meaning of meaning. And they are still rubbing today, so I won't even pretend to try to do it myself. My inclination, then, is that given my understanding of this unavoidable duality, any search for meaning will have to take in consideration the relationship between these two realms, meaning as the result of their interaction. One way I could e exemplify this can be with the circus act of a man walking on a tightrope. In order to maintain his equilibrium, he balances a long pole in his hands, if he was to move in all directions, he would plummet to the ground. But if he was to stabilize his pole, he would also fall to the ground. What is keeping him up, uh, up on the rope is the constant balancing, the constant change of state between motion and static. Another example is electricity. Electricity is not contained in the particles that creates it. It cannot be said that this particle has so many grams of electricity and that one so many grams. We can speak of electrical charges, positive, negative, or neutral, but that is not electricity. Electricity appears out of specific condition between two elements. Break up these conditions and the electricity is gone and is not contained in either of the elements. I see electricity as the relationship between the two elements. Closer to home, we all know what happens in a personal relationship if only one of the persons involved is in love and the other one is not. Each of us has the potential to create love in the same way that some elements have the potential to create electricity, but they do not possess electricity. In the same way, we do not possess love. Love is a relationship, but then again, everything is a relationship. No man is an island is false, because man was never an island. Sensory deprivation studies have pointed out that a child can die from isolation. When Chauch's coup was overthrown, I saw a news report on television about the state of the country's orphanage and asylums. In the orphanage, babies had atrophied legs, almost no movement and no speech. They had spent their lives, day and night, confined to their cribs, with barely any attention given to them. If they reach adolescence, the majority would be transferred directly to the asylums, 
where, with their atrophied limbs, would lay motionless on the floor. This was, and is still, an horrible image. But it also directly points out that our mental and physical health is the result of our relationship to the environment, as opposed to the scientific approach who tries to define everything in terms of diseases or defective genes. Why do we have to wait that things go totally wrong before understanding that they weren't going good before? The need of interaction, of exchange with our environment, be it another person, an animal, nature, or even a spiritual projection, is not an activity which we turn on and off, but is an ongoing system of interchange which is part of our makeup, of who and what we are. As one researcher said, we have to see communication as a process in which the interlocutors engage themselves. An individual doesn't communicate, but takes part in the communication. We are not the instigators of the communication, but participants. Another way to express this is along the lines of Gregory Bateson, who said, we cannot not communicate. Is not a prisoner's worst fear to be locked up in an isolation cell? Isn't it the same when we lock up a man in a padded cell in a sanitarium? Are we helping him or driving him insane? And wouldn't it be anyone's worst nightmare to awake one morning and find that nobody can see him, can touch him, can hear him, that he has become literally a ghost? How many more people will take to an automatic weapon and gun down innocents at McDonald's or women in a university just because they want a voice, they want somebody to listen? Isn't that what Martin Scorsese's taxi driver is showing us? Communication, then, for me, is much more than just one person talking to the other. I would call it a medium of life, where the total is more than the sum of its parts, where the resultant transcends what was there to begin with. We are more than individual bags of flesh inhabited by a soul floating around in empty space. And this is where I feel the scientific attitude has done us most injustice. By cutting everything apart to smaller and smaller units, it has, it has not only lost vision of the whole, but it is also standing in the way for the total to take place. As well, I see a problem within the emotional attitude. That side has been dealt either with spirituality, as religion, or abstractly, with philosophy. Together, they have taken us away from the material world by transforming it either in something of duty, something dirty, or something to be simply avoided. They seem to be more busy with us after our deaths than us while we are still alive. This is what I would call having lost contact with reality. My understanding of communication, then, is as, a, is as a bridge between how I perceive the world out there and how I perceive myself, as a total which is much more than the sum of its parts, conjugating the rational and the emotional duality. Meaning could then be described as our perception of the dynamics of this duality. This stays in line with what Wittgenstein once wrote, the meaning is the use. Or as Bateson expressed, anything should be defined not by what it is in itself, but by its relation to other things. As for our, our tightrope artists, the dynamics between static and motion creates the balance with in which enables him to stay above the ground. So does the dynamics between rational and emotional keeps us above ground by creating meaning. Taking one side in consideration without the other creates a very unstable state of affair of which history is riddled with. Religious wars, holy wars, murderous sex, Jim Jones, are but a few examples. The rational side hasn't fared any better, 
with the destruction of Aboriginal cultures, torture, nuclear threat, and the destruction of life, be it human, animal, or our own ecosystem, in the name of science, or as they like to call it, in the name of progress. So how can it be that something which seems so vital, in my understanding, hasn't been brought up more often? Well, first and foremost, I cannot ignore the political implications of my ideas, which basically doesn't give any ground for a, for a hierarchy of power to establish itself. The political ramifications are too many for me to develop in this lecture, so I will leave it to your imagination to fill in the blanks. At another level, communication, as I have described it, pervades every situation. So like air and gravity, or your mom's cooking, we won't notice it until it is gone. As I have mentioned, we tend to perceive things the moment they go through a change. They can get better or worse, or by example, they can suddenly be there or not be there. Communication is in constant fluctuation or if you prefer, it is always there, so there isn't much chance of accidentally tripping over it. <clears throat> I guess for these reasons, the first ideas on communication came from such fields as anthropology and psychiatry, where they encounter different systems of behavior, either as another culture or as a non-integrated individuals. Some of the researchers in those fields, whom I now want to introduce you to, went beyond the accepted notions and tried to find a new understanding for the problems they encountered. This meant partly leaving behind old theories of human behavior towards a more social view of human interactions. Thus, Gregory Bateson and Jorgen Rusch stated in their book, Communication, the social matrix of psychiatry. Identity is not independent of the social matrix in which a person operates. It is usually defined by the culture in which a person lives. In Pragmatics of Human Communication, Paul Watzlawick, along with Jan Beaven and Donald D. Jackson, give a more direct description of their direction. They give the example of a man brought unconscious in an hospital ward. After examination, his unconscious state remains unexplained. But the moment the staff is informed about the patient having gone through a very strong change of altitude, his condition suddenly becomes understandable. They further state, failure to realize the intricacies of relationship between an event and the matrix in which it takes place either confronts the viewer, the, confront the observer with something mysterious, or induces him to attribute to his object of study certain properties the object may not possess. If a man has a mental disorder, we isolate him and search in his mind. But if we extend these limits to include the effect of his behavior on others, their reaction to it, and the context in which all of this takes place, the focus shifts from the artificially isolated monad to the relationship between the part of a wider system. I find their approach is most succinctly summarized in this further statement. Instead of asking why is this person behaving in this bizarre, irrational manner, rather ask in what human context would this behavior be the best possible, perhaps the only possible one? Bateson state his conception in these words. The schizophrenic must live in a universe where the sequence of events are such that his unconventional communication habits will be in some, some sense appropriate. Ronald D. Langs approach, even if generally not using a communication, communicational terminology, reflects the same preoccupations. He, st he states in Self and Others that 
Every relationship implies a definition of self by other and other by self. In another book, The Divided Self, he describes his therapeutic approach as the attempt to reconstruct the patient's way of being himself in his world, along with the patient's way of being with me. Further still in the politics of experience, we can read, psychotherapy must remain an obstinate attempt of two people to recover the wholeness of being human through the relationship between them. The interaction approach views the possibility of mental disorders as a socially engendered situation, as opposed to a disease one possesses. Their therapy is based on decoding the language of the schizophrenic by identifying the context in which it finds itself. They set as a priority and they set as a priority an understanding and a resolution of the situation as opposed to a blanket control of the patient by the use of drugs and electroshocks. As example, Václavik proposed that crazy communication or behavior is not necessarily the manifestation of a sick mind, but may be the only possible reaction to an absurd and or untenable communication context. Lang also remarks on patients' dialogue with, to regard the dialogue of some schizophrenic as due to some psychological deficit is rather like supposing that a man doing a handstand on a bicycle on a tightrope a hundred feet up with no safety net is suffering from an inability to stand on his own two feet. Thomas Sass a very lucid and highly critical psychoanalyst who has written many books with titles such as The Myth, The Myth of Mental Illness, Ideology and Insanity, The Myth of Psychotherapy, is not only highly interesting to read, but is also very controversial because he relates mental illness as a creation of a political society in the same way as the witch hunts centuries ago. He considers the language of the hysterics like French compared to English. You then can ask yourself how it was learned and what it means, same as what Freud did with dreams. In regards with his patient's condition, he adds, the, the hysteric cannot afford to be aware of what he is doing, for if he were, he could no longer do it. He cannot afford to tell himself the truth, but he also cannot afford to know that he is lying. Lang adds that this language barrier is a setup, is set up as a protection device. The act is what can be said of it, but the schizoid must never be what can be said of him. He must remain always ungraspable, elusive, transcendent. If he were what his act was, then he would be helpless and at the mercy of any passerby. Language, then, when seen as a tool, becomes an indicator of a person's relation with his, with his environment and not as a defective biological process. On this, Bateson wrote, people are mentally healthy only when their means of communication permits them to manage their surroundings successfully. And Fritov Kappa, illness may be seen as stemming from a lack of integration. This is partly, particularly true of mental illness, which often arises from a failure to evaluate and integrate sensory experience. The concept of integration, or lack of, plays a central role in interaction theories, since behavior is consequent to the context in which it finds itself. How we relate to each other is dictated by our environment. According to Musafer Sherif in The Psychology of Social Norms, 
wherever there exists any enduring human grouping, we find a system of customs, values, laws, and standards that regulate the relationship of the individuals to one another and the live activities in which they engage. Edward T. Hall, in The Silent Language, called these regulators patterns. He writes, Patterns are those implicit cultural rules by means of which sets are arranged so that they take on a meaning. Further, he adds, man as a cultural being is bound by the hidden rules, and he is bound as long as he remains ignorant of the nature of the hidden pathways culture provides for him. As an example, he adds, when you are attracted by the other sex, the feelings are yours, but what you say, when, how, and at what appropriate time, what clothes you wear, and, and who decides, is culture. Bateson considers the attribution of behavior to human nature to the misconception of these patterns. His view of culture is as an ongoing message which has basically lost sight of its original sender. He defines it as the cultural network and describes it as follows. In addition to intrapersonal, interpersonal, and organized group networks, which are variously perceived as such by the individual, there is a host of instances in which the individual is unable to recognize the source and destination of messages, and therefore does not recognize that these messages travel in a network structure. For lack of a better word, we describe this unperceived system as the cultural network, since many of the premises of every culture are carried this way. It is characteristic of this network that messages are transmitted from many persons to many. The source and destination of messages are, however, unknown. The pot potentialities for receiving and transmitting are unascribed, and the cor correction of information then is therefore impossible. When participating in a cultural network, people are in many cases unaware of being the receivers or senders of messages. Rather, the messages seem to be an unstated description of their way of life. They attribute to it no human origin, but they themselves transmit the message to others by living in accordance with its content, which they then may regard as human nature. Closer to home, in what we would call a subgroup, is the family unit, which also functions under the same assumptions. Antonio J. Ferreira describes it so, the family myth is a series of fairly well integrated beliefs shared by all family members concerning each other and their mutual position in the family life. Beliefs that go unchallenged by everyone involved in spite of the reality distortions which they may conspicuously imply. Vatslavik adds, the behavior of every individual within the family is related to and dependent upon the behavior of all others. All behavior is communication and therefore influences and is influenced by others. Lang might here add that the family romance is a dream of changing the others who defines the self so that the identity of the self can be self-defined by a redefinition of the others. Given these patterns to which we seem bound, our choice of actions also follows a certain guideline in order to preserve their anonymity. anonymity. Irving Goffman, in his book, The Presentation of the Self in Everyday Life, takes as a basic eunuch the group and not the individual, and describes our, action, our actions as performances towards an audience. He writes, the object of a performer is to sustain a particular definition of the situation. 
this representing his claim to reality. Still further, a performer may be taken by his own act, convinced at the moment that the impression of reality which he fosters is the one and only reality. At that point, the performer comes to be his own audience and incorporates the standards he attempts to maintain in the presence of others. The group being an integral part of our own identity, any attempt to change the functionings of the group will be perceived as an attack on our identity or the identity of the others. Lang offers an insightful description of the state of affair. <clears throat> he writes, the close-knit groups that, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> he writes, the close-knit groups that occurs in some families and other groupings are bound together by the need to find pseudo-real experience that can be found only through the modality of fantasy. This means that the family is not experienced as the modality of fantasy, but as reality. If a family member has a tenable position within the family fantasy system, his call to leave the system in any sense is likely to come from outside the fantasy system. We vary in readiness and in desire to emerge from the unconscious fantasy system we take to be our realities. As long as we are in apparently tenable positions, <clears throat> we find every reason not to suppose that we are in a false, self, false sense of reality or unreality, security or insecurity, identity or lack of identity. A false social sense of reality entails, among other things, fantasy unrecognized as such. If Paul begins to wake up from the family fantasy system, he can only be classified as mad or bad by the family, since to them their fantasy is reality. And what is not their fantasy is not real. If he testifies to any experience outside what they take to be real and true, he can only be involved in a regrettable tissue of fantasy and falsehood in telling them that what they know to be real and true is a regrettable tissue of fantasy and falsehood in telling him that what he knows to be real and true, namely God has given him a special mission to reveal that what they take to be real is a regrettable tissue of fantasy and falsehood, and to this hand, he walks naked and unashamed down the high street and does not care that he is disgracing the family, he is a regrettable tissue of fantasy and falsehood for which he needs therapy. In my view, society deals with their problem child in the same fashion. In order to deal with such a complex interplay of relationship, Paul Václavic and his team at Palo Alto uses the theory of systems as a ground base. He states that the system view offers an exploration of the parameters of the system, the rules and the limitations observed in an ongoing interaction, which can account for both perpetuation and change in the system the here and now of the situation. Further still, in a theory of system, cause and effect are no longer relevant because the system is defined by the nature of the process or the system parameters. Different initial conditions may produce same final results. Different results may come from the same cause. In this effect, the genesis or product of the behavior is not so important as the ongoing organization of interaction. With this approach, he proposes the resolution of mental difficulties through an understanding of the behavior in the here and now of today, as opposed to a search in the patient's past. 
There is no longer the view of a schizophrenic state as the result of one trauma, but as part of a cycle within a system of interaction in, into which it is integrated. Another systemic vision is given in Friedhof Capra's The Turning Point. Systems are integrated whole whose properties cannot be reduced to those of smaller units. Instead of concentrating on basic building blocks or basic substance, the system approach emphasizes basic principle of organization. The activity of systems involve a process known as transaction, the simultaneous and mutually interdependent interaction between multiple components. And systemic properties are destroyed when a system is dissected, either physically or theoretically, into isolated elements. Although we can discern individual part in any system, the nature of the whole is always different from the mere sum of its parts. As way of example, Václavik parallels a rope to a system. The fibers forming a rope are all independent parts. When they are joined together by twisting, the weave transforms them into one continuous body, the rope. The weave is not made of fibers, but take the weave away and the fibers reappear. Thus, the fibers plus the weave, the context, creates the rope. The context is not an environment. There is no outside or inside. They are the conditions of the system. This idea of duality complementing each other to create meaning was also picked up by Marshall McLuhan in his famous dictum, the medium is the message. He also remarked that the source of energy is separate from the process of translation of information or the applying of knowledge. By example, in, in Telegraph, the energy and the channel are quite independent of whether the written code is French or English. And for him, anything in depth has much great interest because depth means in interrelation, not in isolation. Depth means insight, not point of view. And insight is a kind of mental involvement in process that makes the content of the item seem quite secondary. Consciousness itself is an inclusive process not at all dependent on content. Consciousness does not postulate consciousness of anything in particular. The separation of the content from the action which vehicles it diminishes the importance of content as the meaning of the action and gives the act itself also its role in the makeup of meaning. For example, in interpersonal exchanges, language is seen as a tool in establishing the state of the relationship. In this respect, Václavik wrote, in a relationship, each participant seeks in every communication to determine the nature of the relationship. Similarly, each responds with his definition of the relationship, which may confirm, reject, or modify that of the other. Unresolved, fluctuating, not stabilized of this process is the problem relationship. Sass describes this role as object-seeking. He writes, All communication behavior has, among, among other functions, the aim of making contact with another human being. We call this the object-seeking and relationship-maintaining function of language. Still further, the general inter intellectual tendency is to assume that the important thing in verbal communication is the logical content of the message. Thus, we look for all sorts of meaning in language, and rightly so. This very meaningfulness, meaningfulness however, 
distracts attention from the non-specific object-seeking function of language. Accordingly, people are most apt to recognize this function when the meaning of the communication is blatantly unimportant or absent. This is the case of what we call chit-chat, by example, talking about the weather. He also writes that when the relationship is uncertain, the stage is set for exchanges of relatively indirect messages because indirect messages have a dual function to transmit information and to explore and modify the nature of the relationship. Gregory Bateson jumps directly in the bandwagon by separating every message in two units. The report, which conveys information, and the command, which refers to how to react to it. Therefore, ultimately, the relationship between the communicants. But he adds that the command is rarely deliberate or aware. And the more healthy the relationship, the more it is spontaneous and in the background. And the more sick, the more, and the more sick, the more it is predominant and the content less and less important. Thus, in the interac interactional view, mental health is equivalent to a corresponding balance between how a person acts and the environment in which he acts, or how he perceives himself and how he perceives the world around him. A good balance will see him acting in concordance with his, with his environment. Non-concordance, then, is not the sign of a disease, but of a difficulty in reaching a balance within this duality. Since, in my view, meaning corresponds to the balance, the relationship of this duality, it would imply that a person who has reached a strong balance will also have a strong sense of meaning, of purpose, and, most important, of identity. And reversibly, a person who cannot establish a solid balance will have a low sense of identity. Given this, it is understandable that this person will tend to protect whatever is left of his identity by blocking the inherent interaction with his environment by making himself inaccessible. Not only that, but he must also block the notion that he is blocking himself if not the awareness of it would defeat its purpose. So how, according to communication theories, can a person end up in such a catch-22 situation? Václavik attributes it to disconfirmation, laying to mystification, and Bateson to double-bind. It can be summarized in not, in not being allowed to acknowledge your own experience. Václavik states that there are three possible responses to a message – confirmation, rejection, or disconfirmation. Confirmation or rejection confirms the existence of the self, but this confirmation leaves us confused about our identity, our self, by negating the reality of us as the source of the message. Therefore, as it says, you do not exist. He attributes the disconfirmation as paradoxes, statements that are self-reflective and contradictory in themselves, therefore cannot be acted upon. Four basic themes make up this paradox and are as follows. Being punished for correct perception of the outside world or of, or of himself, such as a, as a drunk, alcoholic father who demands that he be perceived as nice. <coughs> or statements as, I hear what you say out loud, but I know that isn't what you really think inside. Other ways are, if you are expected to have other feelings than those you are actually experiencing. If there is a demand and prohibition of the same thing, do what I say, not, I would, not what I would like you to do. Or double standards such as, 
You should always win, fair or foul, but be honest. And demanding spontaneous behavior, as in, be spontaneous. From the book Sanity, Madness and the Family, written with Aaron Esteson, Ronald Lang's attitude can be summarized along the same line. They saw mystification as the denial of identity. In the case they studied, they saw that the, the, the parent of the patient was the judge of, of what the patient recognized, of what she really wanted, of what she really thought, of what was for her own good, of what was a reservation or a change, of what was possible. Or the parent would invalidate what the patient said with, she does not really mean what she says. She is saying this because she is ill. She cannot remember or know what she feels or felt. She is not justified in saying this. Further, writing on trust, to preserve her trust in him, to preserve the patient's trust in him, he destroys her trust in herself. They would say, you are imagining that there is a flaw in your father, and you are mad or bad if you imagine such a thing, and you are mad or bad if you do not believe us when we tell you that you are mad or bad to trust your own perception and memory. The result being that from a situation of, of contradictory attributions, inconsistencies, multiple disagreements, some avowed, some not, she could not tell what was the case and what was not the case. She could not have a consistent perspective on her relation to herself or to others or on theirs to each other or to her. Bateson's double bind theory summarized these two approaches in a clear and concise way. It describes a double bind as a statement made within a clearly defined frame of reference that asserted something about this frame and therefore about itself. He also prescribed three conditions to creating the bind. First of all, it must happen within a physical, emotional, high-value relationship. The message must assert something, then it asserts something about its own, assertion, uh, its own assertion, and these two are mutually exclusive. And most important, it is neither allowed to talk about the contradiction, nor allowed to withdraw from it. To summarize, the inter interactional view not only identifies that it is not allowed to express one's perception of the world and the self, which suppresses the chances of growth and identity, but also that an awareness of this dilemma is also taken away. It isn't surprising then that a person caught in such a bind can only resort to exclude himself from the contact of interchange. His last chance is to cut himself from the system which taught him to disregard his own feelings, his instincts, his perceptions. As I said earlier, it is sad that we have to wait that things go totally bad before understanding that they were going good before. Personally, coming across communication theories made me see that there is much, much more than meets the eye in the everyday run of my life. It gave words to my feelings, to many feelings I had. It made me understand why I saw so many contradictions in the world to which I am part. It also strengthened my belief in what I call the other half of the apple, the one which cannot be grasped, the one made up of feelings, of instincts, of passions. To close, I would like to cite a proverb taken from the book of Lao Tse, which goes, 30 spokes are made one by holes in the hub, by vacancies joining them for a wheel's use. The use of clay in molding pictures 
comes from the hollow of its absence. Doors, windows in a house are used for their emptiness. Thus, we are helped by what is not to use what is. Thank you. So, so I don't know if there's anything you'd like to come back. Thank you. Um, there's a lot, a lot of things said in this, and I guess it kind of more or less projects more of a kind of general direction. But I don't know if there's anything uh, specific you would like to know, since I'm here. Uh, okay. So, thank you very, very, very much for coming. And, uh, well, next week <laughs> is going to be the next one, where I'm going to talk about, um, which is more or less is based a bit on the same attitude about why is the, the, my perception as valid as your perception? Why I, I'm not here to convince people that my art is about this or is about that? And also that this attitude is part of a big system of rules which defines the art world. So this is what I'm going to touch about. So thank you very much for coming.